Good day, everyone. Welcome again to the Wings Radio program, where we hope you will be uplifted and encouraged by what you hear. We want to inspire you through Christ to fly in the power of God's Word to the challenging times in your lives. Be sure to visit the blog page for prophetic words, updates, and godly inspiration at www.wingsofprophecy.com. Now here's your host, Glenda Linkus. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Wings Radio Program. I'm your host, Glenda Linkus, and today we're going to be talking about sins that you're unable to give up. This is a big area in a lot of people's lives, and uh, it's one I dealt with many years ago, and I just want to see if if, uh, some of this maybe can help you. As y'all know, I get emails every week, and, and I don't share the personal emails of people, but I got numerous emails last week on this subject, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. To start with, it's by falling in love with our Savior that we fall out of love with the world. If you walk closely with Jesus for a while, the world just kind of becomes faded and more distant, and you're just not very interested in whatever it has to offer. Jesus said that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. And being in love with our beautiful Savior is exactly what will draw us away from the pleasures of that sin has to offer. As our love for him deepens, we can no longer bear the wall that our sin causes to rear up between us and and him. As we spend more and more time in praise, in his word, and in worship, we fall deeper and deeper in love with him. The main thing I'm going to be talking about in this program is addiction. There are various types of addiction, but addiction is basically the same thing, and it basically starts the same way no matter what your addiction is. So I want to talk about the, uh, we have, um, in America, we have a terrible problem with addiction. 20.6 million people over the age of 12 years old had an addiction in 2011. That's a lot of folks, y'all. In 1999, there were two times as many vehicle deaths as drug overdose deaths. By 2014, so 15 years later, there are almost 40% more deaths from drug overdoses than from car crashes. So if we're talking almost 21 million people addicted in 2011, and we're talking about a problem that is so bad, just talking about the problem of drugs alone, not even touching on other addictions yet, that it's killing more people than car accidents, that's a serious matter that we really need to pay attention to. If we don't have an addiction in our own lives, then this is good information to help people who do have an addiction in theirs because probably all of us know at least one person who has an addiction problem. I want to talk about how unbelief affects sin. This is something I wrote about in the Wilderness Companion. Those of you who have read it more than once probably remember Sometimes we fight giving up a sin because we honestly do not think that we can stop sinning in that area. And the longer you continue a sin, the stronger it gets within you. Because every time you do the sin, you open the door to the enemy. Okay? If you have smoked cigarettes, committed fornication, uh, indulged in pornography, or taken drugs... Whenever you felt like it for, say, 20 years, that sin has most likely become a stronghold in your life, or you would not still be doing it. And it will be difficult for you to imagine and believe that you can truly live your life without it. The Bible talks about strongholds in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So if you never thought addiction was mentioned in the Bible, it was. Addictions are born out of a need to feel better. 
We adopt behaviors that take us out of the present, escape behaviors, or alter our moods because we are not enjoying where we are. Addictive behaviors are a way of comforting ourselves, of feeling better. And very often, y'all, addictions start very early in life. When something happens to us and whoever was supposed to comfort us didn't for whatever reason. If we find some activity or substance that brings us temporary comfort or happiness, it is human nature to want to return again and again and again to that activity or substance so we can experience that comfort again. And that tendency is especially strong in the heat of the wilderness, in the desert seasons. Now, I know that a lot of you listening are in the desert place. God has led you into the wilderness because there's something that he wants to get out of your life. And it is especially trying in the wilderness not to run back to those comfort behaviors. The Lord told me once that the lie the spirit of addiction sells its victims is that they can't live without that thing or behavior they're addicted to. And as we commit the same sin over and over and over, the enemy moves in to set up a stronghold of lies in that area. He begins to tell us that there's no way we can ever stop doing that sin. We can never give up the drugs, the smoking, the sexual immorality, the alcohol, the pornography, or whatever our weakness is. As we return to the sin over and over again, he whispers, See, you can never live without this. If you receive and believe that lie, the stronghold is immediately erected. You begin believing that sin will always be a part of your life and that you are too weak to stop. You are not weak. The enemy has just talked to you into not fighting. Did y'all hear me? You are not weak. You are a victorious child of God. But the enemy has talked you into not fighting him. He has bullied you. That's what bullies do. If you apply the truth of God's word to that lie, you can tear down the stronghold and the addiction cannot remain in place when you do it. We are not required to be slaves to sin because the blood of Jesus has set us free. If you are struggling with a sin, find scriptures about your freedom and confess them over and over again. When the truth gets down deep into your spirit and you get understanding, you will be set free. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. That's Romans six seventeen and 18. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You have to cast those unbelieving thoughts down and stand on the truth of God's word. That if Jesus says you can be free, then you can be free. He wants you to be free of sinful thoughts and behavior. He wants you to be free to serve him with your whole heart. In your whole mind and your whole body. The key here is this. We must only believe. And not also doubt in the back of our minds. Only believe. Belief that is pure no matter how small that amount of belief may be. Is more powerful than a lot of faith mixed with a lot of doubt. Most of us believe a little and doubt a lot. While thinking we believe and then we wonder why nothing that we're believing for is happening. Unbelief that we can stop sinning stops us from stopping the sin in our lives. God's word tells us we can do all things through Christ. If we say we cannot stop, we are lying against the truth of the word of God. The son of God has set us free from sin forever. We do not ever have to give in if we are willing to stand against the lies and claim our freedom. I'm going to tell you how to do that. First, let's talk for a minute about strongholds. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay, so what are they then? A stronghold is a fortress of deceptive thoughts. It is basically a house full of lies the devil has sold you that's built up in your mind. It's a deception that has gained so much ground in your mind that a whole gang of demons has capped out in it to keep you deceived and in sin in in relation to the area of the stronghold. Okay. In the Greek language, the word for truth and the word for reality are the same word in John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
He is the way. So he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the reality, and he's the life. His word is absolute, okay? And it has to be the absolute authority in your life on everything, no matter what it costs you. Can I just tell you that? If the enemy can get your mind, he can get your words, and he can get your actions. He can get your health, your relationships, your finances, and anything else he wants access to, and he can destroy them all. All he has to do is get your mind. In some cases of addiction and strongholds, they have come to you through generational influences, okay? Things like, oh, dad went to prison, and big brother went to prison, and uncle Bill went to prison, so I'll end up in prison too. The devil is presents you with that lie in your mind oh well they all went to prison so you're going to prison too it's inevitable if you receive that that lie and you buy into it and you believe it it starts becoming a stronghold okay nobody in my in my family's ever had any money so i'm not gonna have any money either if you believe the lie of poverty it starts the stronghold oh everybody in my family has heart disease so i'm gonna have heart disease you don't have to have heart disease. You can say, by the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I'm healed through his stripes. I'm not having heart disease. So that's one of the ways that strongholds get in there. Another way that strongholds get in is we listen to wrong teachings, teachings or we buy into the doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, which we know we're in, y'all, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Maybe you listened to a spirit that said it was okay to, uh, you know, go marry someone of the same sex or do this or do that, that the Bible clearly states is not. That would be a seducing spirit, a doctrine of a devil. The doctrine of the devil would be where people start saying, yeah, it's okay to do that. It's not against God. In every case where temptation comes, there is a period of time between the temptation and the moment we give in to the sin when we choose the sin over doing what is right. Sometimes it is years, months, weeks, or days. Sometimes it's just a few seconds. But in those few seconds, the choice is made to go one way or go the other. We choose life or we choose death. We can blame it all on the devil as many times as we want, but we know we chose. And when we continually and habitually choose a sin over doing what's right, we erect walls of our own strongholds. We build those strongholds, y'all. We do the sin and then tell ourselves why we did it to justify it in our mind. So we won't feel so bad about it. We do it again and again, and the process just keeps repeating itself. Eventually, we stop even trying to justify it anymore. We just do it because we like to do it. Sin is serving the God of self instead of serving the true living God. All sin is unbelief in some area. We sin because we want something we don't believe God will give us or is giving us. Think about that. Sin is unbelief in some area. So a stronghold of sin is actually a stronghold of unbelief in some area. We have believed a lie that has exalted itself against the knowledge of God's word. He says he will supply all our needs. And we have departed from believing that in some area and chosen sin over righteousness. Now there are lots of types of stronghold, y'all. Pride, judgment, gossip, controlling and manipulating behavior, substance addiction or drug addiction, Greed, worshiping wealth and prestige, offense, disappointment, bitterness, and unforgiveness is a huge stronghold in a lot of people. Fear and insecurity is a stronghold. Depression, loneliness, isolation, um, sexual sin of any kind, pornography, adultery, fornication, and, and others. Anger and abuse, and those, by the way, erect walls. Uh, I know for a fact they erect walls because God revealed to me my own walls. Disappointment can erect walls in your life and around your heart. Revenge and violence, a stronghold of vengeance. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Rejection, rebellion and lawlessness. These are all strongholds. Independence, self-reliance, death, murder, and violence. TV, video games, vampire stuff, you know, watching The Walking Dead, whatever. Those can become strongholds too. Okay, so how do we destroy a stronghold? Well, if a stronghold is built out of deception, then we destroy it by applying the truth. If I have a box that's black and I want it white, what do I do? I cover the black with white and the black will be gone. We apply the truth of God's word to the darkness and the light obliterates the darkness. Now when I start painting that box white, I won't see it all gone right away. But I've, if I keep painting, 
the box will become white, won't it? It's the same way with us. We transform ourselves by reprogramming the wonderful computer of our minds with the truth which can only come from God and His Word. If you want a computer to do things differently, you change its software. You change its operating system. The Word of God changes the software that we were originally programmed with for sin that was incorrect and causes us to act rightly instead of wrongly. If you want a vehicle to run differently, you can change the engine. The new engine will do things the old engine could not do. When the enemy comes to you saying that you cannot stop this or that sin, that you're a terrible sinner and you just sinned again, hit him with 1 John 3, 5, which says, And ye know that he, meaning Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Just say, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, because he hates that. He knows you're in Christ, and he knows that he he can't touch you if you're in Christ and walk in the right way. God is merciful, he's long-suffering, and he's very compassionate towards our weakness. He helps us, as long as he can see we're trying, until we do get it right. It all comes down to being in the Word of God every day. If you don't know the Word, you can't use the Word to get free. To renew your mind, to defend yourself against the enemy, you can't use it for anything, because you don't know it. And it's so easy to get the Word now, y'all. You can get it on television programs, you can get it on Christian radio stations, you can download podcasts like this one. Uh, you can listen online. You can buy audio books. I mean, there's a million different ways you can get the Word of God. You can download sermons from many of the large ministries and carry them with you on your smartphone and listen to those. I used to do that all the time. You have a radio at your work if you're where you can to listen to Christian radio. You cannot guard against deception in these end times if you don't know the truth because you won't recognize the deception when it comes. If I've been drinking Coca-Cola all my life and somebody hands me a fake Coca-Cola, I'm going to know it's a fake Coca-Cola. Why? Because I'm familiar with the the real Coca-Cola. If you're not familiar with the real Coca-Cola, the devil can send you fake Cokes all day long, and you'll never know the difference. But if you've seen the real thing and familiarized yourself with it by being in God's Word, then when a fraud shows up, you're going to recognize that it's a fraud. Knowing the Word of God is the responsibility of every believer, not just a few who teach about it or talk about it or do podcasts like this. We all have to have oil in our lamps to light our way. Psalm 119, 105 is probably my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your path will be very dark if you don't have his word. Laying down a sin that is a stronghold is uncomfortable. I will tell you that right now. There is not an easy way to do it, and there is not a comfortable way to do it. The only exceptions I have ever seen to that are when, uh, like when the Lord required me to lay down cigarette smoking in 1997. And I didn't have to. I could have said no. Uh, But when he required me to lay that down, he took it from me because I did it. It took me two weeks to obey, but I did it. When he said tonight, I obeyed that night, and I did what he said, and so he took it and he delivered me from it at the same time. I never had a craving, never had a problem leaving it alone, and I had smoked for probably 10 years, and I had tried numerous times to lay it down on my own. I had only ever succeeded once in the early years, and I'd picked it back up, I don't know, like nine months later. So when God took it with no cravings, I was one happy camper, y'all. But you have to, if he's trying to get a sin from you, lay it down. Don't wait, okay? Because the anointing is the strongest. It will be the easiest for you the faster you obey. And, you know, it's kind of like a long time ago, uh, I was going to the doctor, and the doctor told me I needed to have a particular surgery. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I really don't want to do that. And I thought that that surgery was overperformed in a lot of cases. And so I was fighting it, and I said, well, let's try, let's try something else. Surely there's something, a medicine you can give me, something like that. So she gives me a medicine, I take that, it don't work, I go back. She gives me something else, I take that, it don't work, I go back. Over a period of two and a half years, I kept going back and saying, and the problem was getting worse. It was getting worse all the time. And I was still saying, I don't want to be cut. I don't want want to have surgery. Finally, I went to her office the last time and she said, look, here's the deal. I have tried everything on you. There is nothing else for me to try. Your only option left is major surgery. And so finally I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. So she schedules me for surgery. I wake up from surgery. Well, actually, they didn't even put me all the way out. 
I come to after the surgery when I'm fully awake and find out that the surgery was far more involved than it would have been if I had just done it when she told me. When she told me, it would have been a very minor thing. Because I waited, it became a major thing. And it was much longer recovery and very hard and very painful. So, it was a very large incision as opposed to no incision. That's what I'm saying. So, you know, you can keep putting Band-Aids on your problem if you want. But eventually, you're going to develop an infection that is going to get far, far worse if God's trying to get you out of that sin or get that sin out of you. All right? Now, let me explain to you the scripture you can stand on. I'm going to read a little section of verses from 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Okay, your key verse is 1 Peter 5.10. This is the one you stand on. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while. Y'all, when you are laying down an addiction, if you are laying down a sexual immorality habit, a gambling habit, um, any kind of addiction or stronghold in your life, you are going to suffer for a while, okay? There's no way around that unless God speaks to you and says, hey, I want you to give that up and you obey. There's no other way around it. So understand, it is going to be uncomfortable. And you are going to have to refuse it again and again and again. But then, when God sees you're serious, comes the next part of the verse. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, he's called us to his glory. After that you have suffered a while... Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So he's going to establish your deliverance and he's going to stabilize you. But you have to fight it first. You have to fight it in in your flesh first. But the good news is this is your promise. This is your promise of deliverance. If you are willing to stand and fight it for a while and refuse to give in to it no matter what. If you're a cigarette smoker, sit on your hands. Do whatever you got to do. Don't pick up that cigarette. And you talk back to the devil when he tells you you can't do it because the word says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. The word says that nothing shall be impossible with God. You can do it. The devil don't want you to know you can do it. Because you're going to make him look real bad when the truth of God's word tears down his lies in your life. I just want to encourage you right now. If you are hiding a sin, if you are fighting a sin in your life, if you have an addiction in your life and you really want to be free, but you just don't know how to get free and you've tried casting out and you've tried this and you've tried that, this is your way to get free. One of the things you have to do, y'all remember, I laid down alcohol in 1998. God did not ask me for alcohol. And I'd been a drinker for a while. And I could drink. I could definitely drink my share and then some. And I didn't drink beer. I drank straight liquor. And I had, uh, God had shown me that he wanted me to stay in Sarah, Oklahoma for a little while uh, instead of going to my next job down on the coast. And I said, okay, Lord, well, I guess I'll unpack then. So I started unpacking my, my stuff in this little house that I'd rented to store my stuff in. And I came across a couple of bottles of whiskey that I had because I kept whiskey with me all the time on the road. And I said, Lord, you know what? I said, I really am afraid that this could come between us. I said, I know I don't have good judgment when I drink. And I don't want this to damage our relationship. And I said, so I'm going to lay this down. And I'm going to ask you to help me not need it. And I took those bottles to the kitchen and poured them down the drain. They were expensive bottles too, y'all. I'm not kidding. Poured them down the drain and threw the bottles away. And I said, okay, I'm done with that. And I'm going to believe you to keep me. But I'm going to avoid it. Any place that I know where there's alcohol, I'm going to do my part by avoiding it. You have to do your part by avoiding anything to do with whatever your addiction or sin is. If if your sin is pornography, you get the pornography out of the house. If possible, 
burn it. If it's not possible to burn it, take it far enough away from your house, take it to a dumpster, behind a store somewhere, wherever, and dump it so you never come across it again and you don't accidentally lift up a pile of magazines and there it is. Okay, get it out of your house. There are evil spirits attached to that stuff. You cannot have it in your house. Okay, anything that is involved in doing your sin, get it out of your house, get it out of your atmosphere, and don't go where it is. Don't go into adult stores. Don't go into uh, convenience stores where you know they have those on, on display and you might catch a glimpse by accident. Don't do anything that could trigger that uh, temptation, okay? If you will try your hardest not to get into the temptation, God will help you, okay? He will help you. I avoided every place that had alcohol. I didn't even take NyQuil when I got sick. That I mean, I was serious about this, y'all. And then two years later, after I had laid it down, two years later, I worked for uh, Bank of America in Dallas. And there was a branch manager's meeting, and I worked for the divisional manager of mortgage. And I was required to be at the meeting. It was in the evening, and it was at a place that served alcohol, and I didn't. I did everything I could to get out of going, and my boss said, no, I want you to be there. So I said, okay. So I went. I didn't drink. There were a few other Christians who didn't drink, which was kind of helpful, but there were others who did, and I'm not condemning them for drinking. For me, I can't drink, okay? Other people might be able to. It might not be a problem for you. For me, it was a problem. And so I was just sitting there just praying to get through the dinner and not be tempted, you know, because when I had stopped drinking on my own back before I was saved, I had been stopped for, I don't remember how long. And then one night somebody shoved a glass of liquor under my nose. And once I smelled the alcohol, the tr- all the cravings came back and I started drinking again. So I knew that that was a, something that could happen to me, had happened in the past. And before the end of the night, somebody who was drinking a lot and didn't think I was having enough fun shoved a glass of t- cognac under my nose. And I wasn't a cognac drinker, but I smelled the alcohol. And I gasped and recoiled from it like it was a rattlesnake, y'all. And then I was like, oh. and then I realized that nothing happened. I was like, okay, just be calm, be calm. And on my ride back, my drive back home, all I could do was just weep and praise God that it had not triggered the craving. And God spoke to me. And he said, this night have I delivered you from the power of alcohol. You need never fear it again. I walked and stayed away from alcohol and stayed away from everything and everybody that could tempt me for two years. And God delivered me. He knew I was serious. He knew I wasn't going back to that no matter what, no matter how bad it hurt, no matter how uncomfortable I got, no matter how much um, that went with it that I might have missed. You know, the places that you go drink are part of that lifestyle. But I laid it all down. And I said, this is yours, Lord. I don't want it. And he delivered me from it. And he will deliver you too. It doesn't matter what your addiction is. It doesn't matter what the sin is. It doesn't even matter how long you've been doing it. Jesus offers freedom to those of his children who will have it. You will have to do your part. But if you will do your part, he will do his. Let me read you that scripture one more time. It's 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And that means to stabilize you. You won't be wanting to run to it anymore. He will set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you so much for listening. I pray that y'all have a really great week. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in to hear Glenda Linkus on Wings Radio. We hope that you've been encouraged and inspired in your daily walk with Christ. You can find more of Glinda's talks on her YouTube channel, Texas Author and the Number One. You can contact Glinda by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com or by mail at Glenda Linkus, P.O. Box 127, Princeton, Texas, 75407. 
Wings Radio is a non-denominational program and is not affiliated with any other church or non-profit organization. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are a time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, there are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Are there areas of your life where you just cannot seem to get the victory no matter what you do? Are you plagued by depression, poverty, anger outbursts, lust, or failure? Do you recognize a predisposition to commit the same sins committed by your forefathers? You could be under a generational curse or another type of curse. And without understanding, it is impossible to get free. The Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is important for us to get the knowledge that we need in order to get free in every area of our lives. I have compiled all the curse-breaking series into one book called Loosed from Chains of Darkness, Destroying Curses Through the Power of the Cross. You can get Loosed from Chains of Darkness on Amazon.com. It lists prayers for at least 14 different curses, and there are bonus curses in there that I've not taught on before. Learn what the four types of curses are that were revealed to me and how to break each one. How to identify these curses in your lives and in the lives of those you love. Get Loose from Chains of Darkness, available at Amazon.com. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you love deeply? If you have, then you know betrayal by someone you love can be a life-altering experience. But did you know that every Christian must pass the test of absolute betrayal at least once in their walk if they want to go higher? No test hurts more or pulls more strongly on your emotions than when someone you love completely turns on you. Do you know how to pass this test? Through a revelation received from the Lord, I share in my book, The Judas Test, the good news about why betrayal visits us and how to pass this test when it comes your way. Don't let betrayal catch you by surprise. Be ready to pass the test. Read of biblical examples of various types of betrayal and learn what the scripture says about how to pass the test. The Judas Test, available on Amazon.com. 